Take your Bibles tonight. Turn to the book of Acts. Chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. I'm going to apologize tonight uh, at the beginning. Uh, if I happen to say Romans, uh, tonight as I was studying, every time I would try to uh, look something up in, in, in Acts, I kept... Uh, punching up Romans on my computer. I, I, for some reason, I think it, it, it has to do with the text. Um, and also this morning when I was doing my Sunday school lesson, uh, part of it was out of the book of Romans, but it was based in 1 Corinthians. And uh, I always wanted to go to Romans instead of the, the actual book I was in. But we're in Acts chapter 22. And uh, let's see where we want to start. I'm looking at 23. No wonder I can't find my verse. Um, let's start in verse 24. And the, uh, let me tell you what's going on. Paul has been arrested. He's uh, in custody right now. And as you know, uh, they didn't have the uh, bodies in place now. They did, And they didn't have all the... The cameras everywhere that they have now. If you were a prisoner, you usually were beaten. You usually were mistreated. And uh, uh, they were as rough as possible on you. And uh, nobody said anything about it. So here Paul is. He's, a, a, he's, he's been arrested. Uh, why was he arrested? For preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. For telling people they did things they didn't want to hear. Um, Brother Mills talked about in his country it was considered a hate crime if you preached uh, that Jesus was the only way to heaven. Um, it's getting so in this country that preaching the gospel is being considered a hate crime. We talked last week about sheep on a mission and how we have to uh, uh, be wise in the way we handle uh, some of the things that we do and some of the things that we say because it's, it seems that the, the enemy... Uh, the enemies of God and actually the enemies of this country is where we're looking forward to the, the 4th of July and the independence that we have that were uh, uh, given to us by our forefathers who died and fought and they, they, they stood up against the English for their freedoms and uh, we'll get into that a little bit more as we go along um, but the the People that are antagonistic to God, and, and it seems like their, their sole purpose is just to destroy this country. We have to be wise. So here Paul is, he's arrested. Uh, it says in verse 24, The chief captain commanded that he brought, be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging that they might know whereof they cried so against him. Even before Paul has a chance to say anything, uh, he said, go ahead and beat him and get the truth out of him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. And the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was freeborn. Then straightway they departed from him, that they should examine him, that the chief captain also was afraid, after he knew that he was a Roman, because he had him bound. On the morrow, because he would have known certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priest and all the council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to be here today. We thank you for all, uh, just, just a great day. We thank you for the sermon that we heard this morning from Brother Ward, and we trust that he's safely made his way home by now, Lord. And we just ask as we're gathered here that you would continue to be with us, that you would use this time, that we would preach your word, that we would be faithful to your word, that we would uh, preach with conviction that uh, uh, that. Men need this word. Men, men, men need this. Uh, people are dying and going to hell every day. And uh, let us not hold back anything. Give us the boldness that we need to stand and to preach and to, 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 to declare the, the glory of God and, and, and the power of salvation, Lord. We just ask that you would stir up your people here and that uh, we would be uh, more convicted that we might go out, that we might lead others to Christ, that we might see that the that, that uh, um the time is growing short that we might see that the opposition is, 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 has built up against us, but we know that the opposition is nothing to you. Let us take comfort in that as well. Forgive me my sins and just enable me to preach. And as I said, give me a holy boldness that I might just go out and, 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 and preach. Uh, the word tonight lord we just ask that you would just use this uh, as a time would you you would be glorified and that others would see jesus through the preaching of your word all this we ask in jesus precious name for his sake that you would receive the honor and the praise and the glory amen, amen. amen. my text tonight comes from verse 28 Paul, the, the, the centurion, and asked the, the question, aren't you a Roman? In other words, are you a free man? And the chief captain uh, answered, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. I would like to talk about the price of freedom as we are looking at the 4th of July. And we all acknowledge, uh, at least those of us that have some uh, sort of sense, that our freedoms were brought, bought by a price. Unfortunately, many in this country have forgotten that. They think that the, the, the freedom was just given to them, that they, uh, 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 in a way it was, and we'll look at that, but they think of their, themselves as deserving this thing, and they are taking their freedoms and their liberties and using them to try to destroy ours. And they are bringing down the nation. Um, what a great country we live in that, that the, these, uh, our soldiers have come. And uh, as we know, back in the Revolutionary War, they, they fought and they died. And throughout the history of this nation, brave men and brave women had offered up their blood for the love of freedom and for the love of this country. It was a great price that was paid that we would have our freedom as American citizens. But there is also a great price paid by our Lord that we would have our freedom as well. It was a great price that, 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 that he paid. You see this, 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 this chief captain, he said, I paid a great sum for my freedom. Unfortunately for us, or maybe I shouldn't say fortunately because uh, that makes us understand the grace of God, we could not afford our freedom on our own. We could not pay the price. We were debtors. Uh, we were in bondage. We were unable to do anything, but Jesus Christ paid the payment for our freedom. By the way, I was going to tell you going in, this is not going to be a woe sermon. You know, I, I enjoy preaching woe sermons. I, I enjoy finding something that when I look at it, I've never thought of it before, and I go, whoa. And then when I preach it, other people do that. Oh, that whoa, that was deep. I'm probably not going to say anything tonight that you've never heard before. But amen, we still need to hear it. We still need to be reminded of the, uh, of the fact that Jesus died for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. We, we, we get so lethargic in our service to Him. We, we need to realize and constantly be reminded what Jesus did for us. Sometimes we think that we have it so bad in our lives.
What would it be like if Christ had never died for our sins? There is a price that was paid for our freedom by our forefathers. Matter of fact, uh, we've still got men and women today that are, that are serving that we might be free. Now, people want to cut back on our, on our and I don't want to get too political today, but, but to just be honest, people want to cut back on the military. Uh, people uh, are, are in opposition to our military, to our soldiers. The only thing that, that is keeping the enemies of this country on the outside from coming in is the fact that the American soldiers are standing vigilant. Now, our biggest problem, perhaps the biggest problem in our churches as well, is, is not the enemies from without. It's the enemies from within. Our freedom was bought by a great sum. A sum that we could not pay. There are two aspects represented here by Paul and this chief captain in our text. There is, as we've already talked about, the payment. The payment. John liked to use the word propitiation. He used that term, I believe, three times in his epistle. The propitiation. Now we've talked about propitiation. Uh, probably the only place I ever hear the word used, propitiation, is in the Lord's churches or, 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 or preachers preaching in general. It's not a word that's used out there in the world too much. But it is not just a, 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 a how do I want to say this, a Christianese word. It's a word that, that is rooted in, in, in the legal systems of countries. And basically it says a payment that is paid to a, a, a piece for a fault. John said that, 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 that Christ is our propitiation. He not only paid our propitiation, he is our propitiation. He is the payment. So what's the difference? Now, if I go and make a payment for something, I take my money and, and, and I make a payment. He didn't just give of himself. He completely gave himself. He didn't just make a donation. He made a sacrifice. He gave it all. Now, I was going to interject this somewhere, and I didn't know quite well. Christ gave it all that we might be free. You know, there's a payment we make as Christians as well. There is a payment made for us. We talk about freedom being free for us or salvation being free. It is a free gift. We understand that. But to be a Christian... To be a true Christian, to be a, a, a Bible and scriptural Christian, we are to give it all. We are to hold nothing back. Anything that is asked of us, even our very lives, we are to give for the cause of Christ. Now the good thing is, anything we give up for Christ, anything we give for Christ, He gives it back to us. And he gives us more. Try to outgive God sometime. Try, try, try to, to, to give him more than he can give you. What a great reward we receive. Why do, why do we hold back things from God? Why do, we, why do we hold back our time and our talents and our treasures and everything we have from God? Why do we give him 10% and think we've really done something? The biblical Christian gives it all. We don't hold back. There is a price 
that was paid for us to be saved. But there is a price that we pay to be a true biblical Christian. He is our propitiation. Now here's an unusual concept. Not only is there a propitiation, there is a payment that is made in the fact that 1 Corinthians 6.20 says we are bought with a price. It talks about how Christ purchased us. In other words, if you, if you read the context of what it's saying, it says he owns us. We belong to him. Now here's a paradox. We are free because he paid for us and we belong to him because he bought us. Humanly speaking, that may not make much sense. Humanly speaking, it says, well, are, are, are we owned by him or are we free? And the answer is yes. Yes, we belong to him and we are free. <coughs> You'll notice Paul was bound in, in, in our text. But because he was freeborn, he was loosed. We belong to Christ, yet we are free from death. We are free from sin. We are, we are free from our guilt. We are at liberty. Any sin we've ever committed, any sin that, that, that we commit, any sin we ever commit, we have been loosed from that payment. Their chief captain was free because of a great payment that was made. Now understand these analogies are not uh, necessarily completely exact. This man made the payment. We don't know how he made the payment. Maybe someone did pay it for him. I kind of get the feeling the way he talked that he had scraped and he had saved and he had, he had earned and he had worked and, and done everything. We couldn't do that for our freedom. So that's where that analogy falls short. Yes, all was given, but not given by us. It was given by Jesus Christ. Anybody here excited about being free, by the way? Amen. Oh my goodness. When we, when we realize what, what, what God has taken us out of, when we realize what, 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 where we were headed, Just look at the blindness that goes on all around us. People that are lost and on their way to hell and they are bound by this world and they are bound by their own sins and they can't help themselves. They hate us because they can't help themselves. Aren't you glad to be free from that hatred? One aspect of our freedom is represented by that, that centurion because there was a price paid. Or I say the centurion, the chief captain. I may say it several times before we're done. Said that from my head, I always picture him as a centurion. But anyway, the chief captain. But there is another freedom. There is another aspect of our freedom. Paul said, I was freeborn. I was freeborn. Now, we were slaves. We were aliens by birth. Don't get me wrong. But I'm thankful for that new birth. I'm thankful for that second birth. Jesus in John 3 told Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So yes, we are free 
because of a payment that was made by Jesus, but we are also free because we are free born. We, we, we were born again from that natural birth, that, that, that birth that only ends in death. And we've been given a birth unto eternal life. The second birth means we'll never see the second death. Now, I'm pretty sure most of us here know what the second death is. You've read that in the book of Revelation. But just in case uh, 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 there's any, any uh, um, doubt, any, 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 any uh, 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 fogginess of where I'm coming from, the second death is burning in the lake of fire for eternity. We've been free from that because we have a new birth. A second birth takes away takes away our sentence of a second death. If you're only born once, you have two deaths. But if you're born again, if you're born twice, you only have one death. I had a, a, a friend of mine. I remember years ago, Catholic friend it had it, it, there's so many people we talked about some somebody this morning that, that I had a discussion with really people do not know their Bibles they know what they've been told they know what they've heard they, they, they know what they, they've heard preached this Catholic friend of mine did not have never heard I guess he'd heard the term but he was referring to some woman who was I, I don't know you know much about her never met her but he said, she's one of those born-again Christians. Those are the worst kind. And I said, Dave, I'm a born-again Christian. I'm the worst kind. I'm the worst kind of Christian. Now what he meant was, the, the, those born-again Christians, as he thought, those were, those were ones that meant business. Those were the ones that were really believing and acting upon a... Uh, 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 the Word of God. Unfortunately, at that time in my life, you couldn't say that about me. I was just going along. Going with the flow. Never making a stand. Silently saved. I thank God that God opened my eyes to what I was doing. That I was wasting my life. That I was losing reward. Giving my life to the things of this world rather than giving it to Christ. Oh, with a new birth, you become a new creature. You have new desires. You, 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 you long for new things. And we get so excited sometimes, uh, or, or we should when we get saved. But many people, many people, that excitement kind of diminishes over time. And they fall into a rut. Or they've never been taught They've never been taught what it is to give your life for Christ. There are two aspects represented here. One is by birth, the new birth. There are two births there. One is by payment. There are two aspects of that payment. There is a propitiation by which he sets us free and there is the payment, the price that is paid that he might own us. There are also two judgments I believe represented here in our text. As we read, Paul was arrested. 
They identified him as a Jew by his first birth, by his natural birth. They understood that Paul was a Jew. But all of a sudden, something else came up. He says, is it, is it right for you to bind me, being that I'm a Roman citizen? All of a sudden, things changed, didn't they? When his citizenship, when his freedom was, was, was brought to light, everything changed. They were no longer going to scourge him. They were no, he, was, he was no longer to be bound. He was facing a judgment. He, they, they were going to bring him before the court. And they were going to judge him. And the judgment changed. There are two judgments. There are two judgments. There are the judgments, or is there's the judgment of the free. The judgment of those who are citizens of the kingdom. Oh, what a difference in the two judgments. Paul could not expect any mercy if he wasn't a citizen of the kingdom. Paul was completely in their hands and they could, would do anything they wanted to him if he was not a citizen of the kingdom. But when it came to light that he was a citizen, that he was free, that legally, legally, He had an appeal. He had an advocate. He had the kingdom on his side. It all changed. He was loosed, was he not? There are two judgments. If you are a citizen of the kingdom, if you have been freed by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you are a, a saved individual, if you have been born again, if the payment has been paid for your freedom, You've got a different judgment. You will sit or stand someday at the judgment seat and you will be judged. Not on whether your good deeds outweigh your bad. Not, not if you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell because, okay, you've done this, you haven't done this. And no, that, that, that is, once again, that is false teaching. The judgment that you face is just what you've done for Christ. The judgment will determine the reward that you get and also the reward that you lose. You, and not just you, everything that we've done will be exposed. Now the big thing is it won't be exposed to God. It won't be revealed and God will go, oh, look what you did here. Or look what you didn't do here. God already knows these things. We walk around and we have our secret thoughts and the secret things that we do and our attitudes and we think because no one else knows about them or maybe just close friends or close family, the public in general doesn't know about it. We think we're okay. God already knows. When we confess our sins, we're not confessing anything to God that He doesn't already know. Now, Brother Raymond, I'm sure as a police officer, many times you had to interrogate people or interview them, question people, might be a better word. Probably you already knew whether they were guilty or innocent before they ever opened their mouth. They didn't need to confess. And probably the more they talked, the more they incriminated themselves. God already knows. Why not confess it to Him? You don't have to tell me. Now you do hinder the church. You hinder a lot of things if you've got secret sin in your life. Don't get me wrong. But tell it to, uh, confess it to God and He already knows. 
You ever tell somebody something and, and, and you think you're getting something off your chest? And I already knew that. There is a judgment seat. We will see the, the things that we have done and get rewarded from those things. But, but the whole world, all of creation, every individual will see what we've done, the things that we thought were hidden, the things that were done in private, the whispers that we had. Everyone will know. So what's the best thing to do? Just not do them. Not do the things that we shouldn't do. Everyone will know the opportunities that we had that we didn't present Christ to someone or, or, or to help someone. The time that, that, that someone was in need and we had the ability to help them. And we passed on it because it might cost us something. All those things are going to be revealed. And we will see reward given to us and we'll see uh, rewards that we could have had that we'll never see. Oh, but then there's another judgment. What if Paul hadn't been a, 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 a citizen of the kingdom? What kind of judgment do you face if you don't know Christ as your Savior? There's going to be weeping at the judgment seat because we're going to see where we failed our Lord. But there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth at the great white throne judgment. I heard someone here recently refer to a song. Y'all remember that song, the, the Last Kiss? I think it came out in the 60s or the, maybe the 50s uh, about the boy and his girlfriend and she, she dies in a car wreck and... Uh, uh, Oh, where, oh, where can my baby be? If that helps uh, some of you, some of you are still looking at me like uh, I'm speaking some foreign language. Am I, am I speaking, a, a, you know, if I got Pentecostal, am I speaking in some unknown tongue right now? Or you, you understand what I'm saying? There's an old song uh, uh, about this young couple that were out and they were in love and, and, and the girl dies in a car wreck. And somebody said that was the saddest song ever. And I thought, you know, I've heard sadder songs than that. And I started thinking of it, there's an old song, Please Search the Book Again, about a man that had a dream that he was standing at the judgment and, and his name was not in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he was begging and he was pleading. To me, that's a sad song. It, it, it is sad to lose a loved one, don't get me wrong. Oh, but to lose your soul. To lose your soul. Somebody said this, the saddest verse in the Bible, and, and I'm, I can agree with this, is out of Jeremiah. The summer's ended, the harvest is past, and we are not saved. How will someone feel at the great white throne judgment? There are no rewards. There are only Perhaps opportunities that they, that they will see that, that someone presented the gospel and they passed on those things. That they'd heard the gospel and they rejected it. They scoffed at it. They laughed at it perhaps. Or they just put it off. That song I, I just uh, quoted at uh, Jeremiah, there's a song almost persuaded that quotes that song somewhat. It says, oh, some more convenient day on the I'll call. And that's taken from the book of Acts. There are two judgments. Our freedom was paid for by Jesus Christ. We receive our freedom at that new birth. My friend, today, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, you cannot claim citizenship into His kingdom. You cannot claim to have your sins paid for by Him. There is a judgment waiting. Would you trust Him today? Would you? Would you make that payment 
sufficient and efficient in your life. Would you stand?